Today I'm having a look at the Athlon 64 3400 Plus, except in this case it's the mobile variant in socket 754. This particular chip runs at 2.2 gigahertz, although in this video I'm running at 2.4, and with a multiplier of 10 for bus speed of 240. This motherboard uh, apparently tops out at around 250 megahertz front side bus uh, past that 255 and higher it won't post and the processor itself seems to top out at just around 2.4 gigahertz stably any more than that again it either won't post or won't boot so that seems to be the happy area for this processor the motherboard in this test is the ASRock K8NF3, which is a cheap and cheerful motherboard, around $12 and up on eBay, used and brand new. This has been a pretty decent board, and I'm pretty happy with it. For $12, I really can't complain. Sadly, I was hoping it would maybe get to $300, but, you know, that's a lot of them didn't even get that high. There's only a very few select boards that ever reached that high. This board only has two memory slots and two gigabytes of RAM. It's plenty of RAM if you know how to tweak XP. After having ran this chip for a while on this motherboard, I'm not exactly sure that the mobile chips were really any different than the desktop chips. They had a little bit less uh, TDP, but and a little bit less voltage, which I think is what got them down to the 62 watt TDP. But beyond that, there's really nothing all about this chip that identifies it to the motherboard or even CPU ID as a mobile chip. And yeah, I think it's just a better bend desktop chip, frankly. It's just running a little bit lower voltage to get a little bit lower TDP. This cooler has absolutely no problem whatsoever keeping this chip cool. And it contacts the processor very nicely. I had no mods that needed to be done to make this all work. In fact, the clipping mechanism is quite tight on this chip, which surprised me. But then again, this cooler actually came off of a 1366 processor, believe it or not, with a one of those plastic ring adapter things. So I'm not sure how tight this thing would be on a capped processor, but... I'm going to be testing a capped processor next. Uh, I'm just not going to say which one at this point. Throughout testing, I ended up running three video cards in this just to see which one ended up uh, being the better suited. I have a 9800 XT, an 800 XT, and a 3670, or is it 3650? I think it's 3670. Anyway. That card actually ended up being the slower of the three, believe it or not. And the best one of the three is the X800. So that's the one uh, I'm going to be including in the results, benchmark results for this particular video. Although the 9800 XT did very well, but the 800 XT was just a little bit faster. At some point, I'd like to get a 1950 XT AGP, or was it a Pro, 1950 Pro? I can't remember. Anyway, the AGP version of the 1950. And I think that's going to be probably about the best AGP card, probably all around, even though you've got the 3850. I think the 1950, for the most part, is actually going to beat the 3850. I don't have a 3850, so I wouldn't really know. Maybe somebody else will have one, like Phil, maybe, and we can do some benchmark comparisons. I don't know. I like to see what my theory is. The 1950 is going to whoop its butt. The BIOS on this motherboard is pretty nice. Uh, I wish for a little bit better overclocking options, but for an AMD system, it's really not too bad. Again, this was a $12 motherboard, so I really can't complain all that much. The CPU speed here, you can see we've got the bus speed and the multiplier and all that stuff. And the motherboard only goes up to 1.45 volts and 0.8 volts at the minimum level there. 
And you got at the bottom here, you got some memory timings and stuff like that. Pretty good selection of memory timings, actually. Um, and then there's the regular usual stuff that you see in BIOS. It's pretty, pretty average, really. Nothing terribly fancy here, but at least we can overclock pretty well. As I said, the bus speed technically can go up to 300 megahertz. This is an Enforce 3250 board. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier. That's what chipset is running on this board. In the system monitor here with the temperatures and the voltages and stuff like that, it's interesting that it's showing the CPU core voltage is actually about half a volt higher. And actually probably three quarters of a volt higher. It kind of jumps around a little bit there uh, than what it's set to in the BIOS. I don't know if this is just a sensor reading glitch, if it's a programming glitch, or if this is actually real. I don't know. CPU ID also shows the same thing. So I don't know if this is accurate or not. It would mean, if it is, that I've actually got another 0.75 volts to work with, although I've been running it at 1.45 this whole time, and this is the most clock speed I've been able to achieve with this processor. So there still wouldn't be any advantage to it, even if it is. It just means I might be able to lower the voltage a little bit. But as it is, this chip really does not run that hot with this cooler. Uh, and this cooler is very nice in the fact that it keeps the voltage regulators and the capacitors that are around the process, keeps those things nice and cool, which is a big bonus to this heat sink. It also kind of blows a little bit on the RAM, too. So if you can keep some cool air getting to this heat sink, this fan, it's really a pretty decent combination here. And I've seen these solid copper uh, flower coolers on eBay for like 10 bucks. From China now I'm I'm assuming they're copper they might be copper plated or copper painted I don't know there are aluminum ones of these that are like half that price but it's flower copper flower coolers are kind of hard to find in general that's not a bad option really and what's nice is that AMD has not changed the mounting system for the heatsink since socket 940 so anything modern, water, or air will fit this old of stuff, which is really cool. You can use a modern tower cooler of gigantic proportions if you wanted to on this thing, and it would work just fine. So now let's go ahead and take a look at this platform as it's set up right now uh, in benchmarks and in some gameplay. Pretty Mark 2000, this combination with this video card is laying it down pretty thick with nearly 23,000 for a score, 21,000 for 3D Mark 2001, 10,000 for 3D Mark 2003, roughly 5,000 for 05 and almost 2, not quite 2, for 2006. Now this card, this processor here, we're looking at about up to 2003-2004 era, maybe 2005 era with graphics turned down a little bit as for games. The 3D Mark benchmark is typically a couple years ahead of the curve when it comes to how much hardware it's going to take to actually run a particular game. So I'd say this system is probably suitable up to 2005-2006 era. Games probably have to start turning the detail down. Um, a little bit there, but up to 2003 at least, this is doing pretty good. This particular card, I can tell you right now, in 3D Mark 2003, is nearly twice as fast as it was with the 3650. Just to give you guys kind of an idea of what kind of performance difference we're talking about between those two cards. Aqua Mark scoring about 62 frames per second here. It's a long way of saying 62 frames per second rounded there. Quake 3, 1280 by 1024. Doing 256 frames per second there, which is not too shabby. 
This is about 60 some frames per second faster than we were getting with the 3650. Just kind of throwing that out there. Doom 3, we're doing 1280 by 1024 again. 64 on the chart for that one. Unreal Tournament, the minimum is 55, the max of 177, that's pretty impressive there. An average of 93, we're still not quite getting to that minimum 60 frame per second that I was kind of looking for, but we're close, very, very, very close. I decided to throw PC Player 3D, the Windows version, into this. It's doing basically 700 frames per second and not displaying quite correctly on this video card. So maybe it's too the system's too fast to display this stuff correctly. I don't know. 700 frames, that's probably not it. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's kind of a pointless benchmark, but I thought I'd run it anyway because I thought that was kind of funny. time here this demo the system has absolutely no problem whatsoever running this benchmark although this benchmark is significantly older than these components so it should this will run on a Pentium 2 without a problem so it's a nice demo to run though for videos I think that's the only reason why I'm including it This Arise demo here is era correct, but the funny thing is, is that even though this demo says it requires a minimum of a Pentium 4 2 gigahertz, uh, I've run this on a Pentium 3, a uh, mid speed, mid level speed Pentium 3, let's say like, like a 700 there, in the Athlon K7s, and it runs on there really nice. Um, yeah, it uh, definitely doesn't need a Pentium 4 to run this demo sufficiently, but uh, nevertheless, I'm running on this system, and of course it runs flawlessly as well. This is another nice demo to do for videos. Uh, we don't get any kind of benchmark results from it, but we don't really need any after running all the other stuff we've already ran. It's the rain earlier. Everyone's gone in. Black as pitch out here. They doubled the watch. This castle's as old as South Quarter. See the way the stone is? Pulled off an army. Probably has. You really think so? And who knows? It's an old part of town. Streets are all different here. Not like Aldale or Stone Market. Ah, uh, what do you know about it? I could have been in the... <gasps> Sounded like a... Is somebody Bloody around? Hell. Ah! <laughs> oh, oh, come on! So the game I'm going to be playing in this video is Thief Deadly Shadows. And this game is from 2004, so it fits right into that era that I was mentioning before. Uh, 
I said this was probably the 2003 to 2005 combination of parts here for the most part. This is right smack dab in the middle of that. This particular game, the minimum requirements for the processor are a Pentium 4 1.5 or an equivalent Athlon XP, a quarter gig of RAM, DirectX 9 compatible video card, and the uh, supported graphics chipsets are 8500 ATI Radeon 8500 all the way up to the 9800 and then we've got the GeForce 3 all the way up to the 6. For most of the time the game is running in the 50s and 60s dipping down into the 40s and we tend to get down into the 30s occasionally at least in this outside area inside of the building I noticed it was pretty much rock steady at 60 frames per second of course this was when I was just running it with vertical sync enabled so that's why we're running at 60 probably would have went higher but this is again like I said a 2004 era game and even though this hardware is pretty decent for that time period we're still looking at it being fairly taxing on the system of course 30 frames per second is still playable there's nothing wrong with that. I didn't really notice any difference in performance game playing wise dipping between 30 and going up to 60. I mean, we were doubling the frames per second there, but it didn't I didn't really feel it in the gameplay at all. So, I, you know, if I didn't have fraps running, I probably wouldn't have known. I thought about uh, including Crisis I test, but I didn't really quite get around to it. I actually have Crisis. I bought Crisis off eBay, and I noticed that CD, the DVD, is not in the box. I bought it like probably a year ago. I noticed it's not in the box, and so I don't know if it's actually in one of my CD-ROM or DVD-ROMs, or if I somehow didn't get the DVD in the box and I just never checked it until now. I don't really remember. Anyway, I do have the game downloaded. And since I have a genuine key now for it, it doesn't really matter. I will do Crisis stuff, I guess. Since maybe people care about Crisis, I don't know. But I am actually going to do a different kind of test, though. Something I have noticed in messing with... Well, not really modern systems, but, you know, since Athlon, Pentium 3, XP type stuff, and even the Athlon 64. Um, playing back YouTube videos, uh, I've noticed that that is quite a challenge for some of these systems of this vintage to do. Even the dual processor stuff really struggles. Um, and so I'm going to start using that as a comparison tool. We're not going to talk about can it play Crisis. We're going to say can it play a YouTube video. And that's what we're going to look at right now. So does it play a YouTube video? Well, yes it does. It does play a YouTube video pretty well. I'd have to say this is one of the better processors I've seen to play back a YouTube video, but we are still pegging it pretty hard to do so. But the next test for this platform is going to be a little bit more of a unique Athlon 64 chip. It's going to be a little bit slower chip, it's going to be a different color chip too. But it's not a chip that you see every day. Although the seller I got it from had a lot of them, which is interesting. And I'll talk about that maybe a little bit in the next video. But until then, if you feel like liking that smash button there, <laughs> as Victor Bart has said, I won't hurt my feelings any. Peace out, everybody.